when citizens of the conservative South German town of Stuttgart first saw this poster in 1927, they realized that the forthcoming Deutsche Werkbund housing exhibition wasn't going to be to their taste. A brutal red cross defaced an illustration of just the sort of lavish, traditional interior which they would have aspired to. The idea behind the Weissenhof housing exhibition was to display the latest Werkbund thinking on cheap housing. In fact, it turned out to be one of the first and most impressive shop windows for what came to be known as the international style. It split the Werkbund into two parties, the progressives behind Mies van der Rohe, who became the exhibition organizer, and the more conservative majority who still followed the principles of Hermann Mutesius. In the last years of his life, Mutesius suspected that style had become the overriding preoccupation of most modern architects. If you look at the root of the problem, you'll see that what's really motivating this group of architects is the new form. It's the new form which dictates the flat roof, with all that that entails in the way of unresolved arrangements. The excessive over-lighting of living rooms, completely unbroken continuous windows all round the house. All these things have absolutely nothing to do with rationalization, nor with economics, nor with constructional necessities. It's purely a question of form. In 1927, every house built in the Weissenhof Siedlung had a flat roof. The issue of the flat or the pitched roof was just one of those which greatly exercised visitors to the exhibition. And I think most German visitors would have agreed with Mutesius that the Weissenhof solution was a dogmatic one, based on formal stylistic principles rather than on mere utility. Mies van der Rohe and the architects who actually built the houses in the Weissenhof Siedlung would not have agreed. They called the exhibition Die Wohnung, a place to live, and they claimed that their aim was to find revolutionary new solutions to the practical problems of cheap housing. Well, in what ways, if any, did they succeed in this aim? And in what ways was the exhibition more the product of a formalistic aesthetic? Before we look at these houses in detail, I think we can answer these two questions in a general way. For instance, it's perfectly easy to show that there was an aesthetic at work. You only have to look at a model of the exhibition to realize that this wasn't a haphazard arrangement. The main accent is formed by the Mies van der Rohe block, which runs along the spine of the ridge here. While at this end, you have the Oud block here and the two Le Corbusier houses forming a strong accent at this end. Most of the other houses are strung out along the ridge, following the contours of the land. These are the houses which suffered most damage during the war. And then here at the end, another strong accent formed by the Baron's block. Like many others, this block suffered damage in the war and was rebuilt with serious alterations. It's amazing how much difference the addition of the pitched roof has made to the look of Baron's block today. It almost looks like some kind of an alpine hotel rather than part of a group of revolutionary buildings. The houses by the Dutch architect, Mark Stamm, on the other hand, are pretty well exactly as new, and you notice things straight away. There's the flat roof, the blue color of the walls, the strip windows set almost flush into the wall's surfaces and run together almost continuously along the top. Mies van der Rohe, like Peter Behrens, had the job of building a block of flats rather than a row of terraced houses. The idea of packing 24 flats into a single building in a suburban settlement seemed wrong to many people. 
they resented this introduction of big city values. Although the exterior gives the impression of standardized units in rows, Meath made up for this with a system of lightweight internal divisions so that no two flats were alike. He articulated the front of the block through the vertical ascent of the staircase windows, which interrupt the floor levels as revealed by the other windows. On each landing of the staircase, there was originally a French window enclosed by a balcony railing of tubular metal. Contemporary critics noted with glee that the balcony railings at the front and the back of the building were too widely spaced and were a hazard to children. They've had to be filled in with corrugated plastic. The back is more informal than the front, being more protected from public view. There are small gardens at ground level, and there are balconies for the living rooms in the flats above. Residents have managed to make them look quite individual. The back has greater depth to it than the front, with these T-shaped projections for the washing shelters on the roof, and the projecting balconies below. On the other side, the way the windows are divided up gives the impression of larger, more abstract glazing strips with less of a feeling of individual rooms behind. The partition walls, which were flexibly arranged between the steel bearing posts, used a variety of more or less impermanent materials. In this room, a plywood fitment divided the bedroom from the sitting room. You can see it doesn't even reach the ceiling. Sophisticated, white, international-style blocks of flats like this were soon to spring up all over Berlin. Finally, we come to the Oud houses, which, like Mart Stam's row, were basically terrace houses linked together in a carefully articulated but continuous strip. These simple white cubes with their powerful rhythms and clever proportional relationships are inconceivable without bearing the style or constructivist sculpture and painting in mind. Typically, the end wall is left without windows to show that the row was theoretically infinitely extendable. I think we've seen enough to realize that there was some kind of common aesthetic at work. But ironically, the three buildings we've just looked at are among those which most embodied the concepts of economic and structural reform. Oud's whole rationale was to allow his streets along an east-west axis so that one side faced south, the other side faced north. This is the north-facing front, and Oud insisted that it should serve purely functional purposes. This is what he wrote in 1927. A thin concrete wall as a partition from the street guarantees a neat appearance from the outside. A metal door gives access to the courtyard, open at the top to allow someone in the kitchen to see who is ringing the bell. The door can be electrically opened from the kitchen. Tradesmen can sell their wares from the courtyard through the kitchen window. Also in the courtyard, you can store bicycles in a bicycle shed. Oud maintained that a family without servants should eat in the kitchen, but he provided a hatch into the living room, which could also be used for keeping an eye on the children. You can see the hatch in this photograph of the kitchen as it was. Seeing the living room 
with the original furniture makes it much easier to realize why visitors were appalled at the sparseness and austerity. The furniture was formalistic and hard. The walls and ceiling and floor are polished and uncluttered, but they also look cold and bleak. The effect of the long window onto the garden can still be appreciated today, but the sparseness has been considerably tempered by being lived in. From the hall, the stairs lead up to the drying room over the washroom on the north front. You can see here two of the little porthole windows, beloved of all the architects in the exhibition. Before the laundrette or the cheap electric clothes dryer, hanging out your washing on wet days was a major problem for working class people. This room originally had long narrow windows running all the way around, high under the ceiling for ventilation. The drying room and washroom formed the block-like projections on the north fronts, and here you can see the windows as they used to be. This construction photograph shows, too, the concrete pouring equipment in action. Finding a dramatic formal expression for mundane functional services was the key to international style ideology. This is where Mies van der Rohe provided for his washing lines on the roof of his block. But a flat roof has more uses than drying, washing, or for sunbathing on a roof garden. Oud wanted to use his for lighting and ventilating the rooms below. This allowed him the freedom to have all his bedrooms along the outside walls on the upper floors to give them normal windows. In each house, there are three skylights. The small central one lights a lavatory, the one on the right lights the stairwell, and the other on the left lights and airs the bathroom. On the left is the door to the second bedroom, on the north front of the house. Straight ahead is the door to the main bedroom on the south front. This double bed practically fills the bedroom. But amazingly, this room was originally divided into two by Oud. The window faces south onto the gardens, and the view you get from it partly makes up for the small size of the room. These houses might seem very small and, to use one critic's expression, puritanical. But to see them on the south side with their colourful gardens is to realise that there was a very human side to Oud's rationalisations. Let's look briefly now at the houses of the other Dutchman who contributed to this exhibition, Mart Stam. Like Oud, Stam was supposedly concerned with functional efficiency. The windows run in a horizontal strip and are made of thin metal frames set very flush into the walls. The horizontality of these windows is deceptive. They don't light a long room as you would expect, but a vertical feature, the stairs. This inconsistency was criticized during the exhibition. The concrete and steel frame construction has led to serious problems with rainwater leakage and it's just one of the signs of technical teething problems with which these houses were full. The brittle rendering easily came away from the steel skeleton and breeze block infill. The problems arising from unconventional use of materials were frequent. These plywood doors used by Mies van der Rohe have peeled away under the effect of sun and rain. Concrete slabs were always unreliable, chipping and cracking when exposed or pierced by metal footings. Drainage problems created by flat roofs were not always completely solved either. But the present occupiers also complained of the complexity of the window opening mechanisms and the fact that not all the windows in fact open, 
so it's extremely difficult to get at them to clean them. These upper windows look onto the garden at the back, though they're similar to the ones in the front. There are two big windows to each sitting room, but they are run together so that you can't distinguish the divisions between the houses. This room, like the Oud sitting room, looked extremely sparse with its tonne bentwood furniture and polished linoleum. The large sitting room windows form a wall of glass facing the garden. They've been made possible by the steel skeleton. The metal staircase on the left used to come down to the study from the living room above. The furniture and the bookshelves are in tubular steel. This industrial spiral staircase gave access to a sun terrace on the roof of the studio at the end of the row. Stam, even more than Oud, was ready to flaunt the vocabulary of raw industrial materials. Like Oud, he made use of metal front doors and set thin windows in the frame. Even the steps up to the front doors are treated in rather a grand engineering manner, with cantilevered slabs of concrete and metal handrails set straight into them. Even the letterbox was made of metal. It's far too small for most pieces of mail. The way Mies van der Rohe used metal for handrails for his flats is much more elegant, exploiting the shine of the chromium plating on brass and the effect of smoothly curving and interacting lines to the full. The Oud and the Stam houses had the feel of mass-producible economic housing about them, with plenty of signs of a serious effort to solve the problems of cheap housing. The Oud houses cost almost half as much to build per occupant as these houses here. These are by Le Corbusier. And Le Corbusier was just as keen in theory on the idea of mass housing, but his overriding concern lay with monumental architectural form. The house bristles with doctrinaire tenets, which Le Corbusier considered essential for all modern architecture. I'm sitting in one of them now, the roof garden. Le Corbusier published five principles in 1927, one of which insisted that the roof area should be given over to a terrace. And originally, the whole of this space here was completely open with this concrete sunshade over the top. Since then, part of the open roof has been closed off to provide extra bedrooms. It's a typically attractive Corbusier idea, but aroused much indignation amongst some of the visitors, one of whom remarked that with gardens all around, the roof garden idea was better suited to city blocks of flats. The structure of the house depended on these steel girders rising up through the whole house and supporting each floor slab. In places, these steel girders are embedded in concrete and in other places, left open and just painted. With the floor slabs supported by the steel girders, Corbusier was able to carry out his free facade with an endless long window, completely disguising all the subdivisions of the rooms inside. It was made more dramatic by the expanse of wall above and below the window. In this house, the long window corresponds to the continuous open space of the living rooms inside. It's typical of Le Corbusier's flats that having saved space in the living areas with his open plan, he was prepared to waste it here on the ground floor, where there are only a few built-in service rooms, while the rest is left open for sitting in the shade or really just to show off the structure. The last house that I want to look at is by Hans Scherum. It was almost as expensive as the Corbusier house to build. This house, like the Stam and Mies van der Rohe buildings, is based on a steel skeleton but Sharoon uses the structural freedom of the skeleton for thoroughly formal purposes, cantilevering out the terrace over a sitting room with a curving window.
Inside, this sitting room is a beautifully conceived space, with a large window on the left and a slightly raised music room flanked by the curving window. The pencil-thin supporting girder has been covered with coloured terrazzo chips. Originally, the austere decorative treatment allowed a more consistent flow of space, which has been lost. The right end of the long window has partly been filled in, too. We've already seen the conception for this kind of terrace in the Corbusier houses, a space which is part indoors and part outdoors. Like many of the architects whose buildings we've looked at, Sharoon liked to play around with amusing forms based on marine styling. Here he's set a D-shaped electric light fitting into what appears to be a structural wall supporting the slab above. In the angle of the wall on the right, he deliberately placed a window which turned the corner, demonstrating that only a thin steel girder supported the floor above. The staircase for the upper floor is curved as well. Sharoon demonstrates his use of industrial materials by leaving the steel bolts exposed. On the outside of the house, the circling, screwing motion of the stairs is dramatically expressed in a dynamic spiral. Sharoon has managed to create a house here as individualistic and as flexibly sculptural as he could wish. One of the things which makes the exhibition so interesting is that it embraces such a wide range of different attitudes to modern housing. The Sharoon house, with its three-dimensional sculptural forms and rather luxurious layout, represents one wing of what was to be called the international style. The workers' housing terrace, on the other hand, by Mart Stamm, with its severe and cubic form, potentially mass-producible and infinitely extendable in rows, stands for the other, more functionalist wing of the modern movement. And yet, as we've seen, it's impossible to make a hard and fast distinction between what is based on functionalist or aesthetic criteria. As the Weissenhof exhibition director, Mies van der Rohe said, Rationalization and standardization are only part of the problem. Rationalization and standardization are only means. They should never be ends. The problem of the new dwelling is fundamentally a spiritual problem. And the struggle for the new dwelling, merely a wing of the great struggle for new ways to live.